Um, oh, recording in progress. Perfect. So yeah, no other intro needed. Um, this is basically the accumulation of the last seven years of uh, experimenting with clients, taking courses. And uh, this is a subject like very uh, dear, near to my heart. So there's, I'm happy to discuss anything afterwards, or if you have any questions after, I'm happy to send any uh, research articles afterwards. You have my email right there. Uh, this works. Okay, so persistent concussion uh, syndrome or symptoms, it's pretty much defined as having three concussion symptoms that persist longer than three months, according to the Mayo Clinic. 90% of concussions do resolve within you know, two weeks time, so that's the norm. But how come the, you know, let's say 10 to 15% of mild traumatic brain injuries, how come they don't resolve and it takes much longer? Uh, I have some clients that it's been two years, some it's been five, right? So why are they not getting better? Um, research is also showing that there's effects on cognition, memory and learning and executive functioning later on post-concussion. Uh, this is a big topic. There's always studies coming out every week on concussion. So maybe we'll know in the next five years or so what the lasting damages to uh, one concussion to multiple concussions are, right? Even though let's say you've given enough time to heal in between each. Um, more than half of the patients with MTBI, they've returned to work by one month. The other, uh, they the other 80%, 80 percent of that returned by six months. So what about the others, right? Then this is a big, uh, let's say it's, it's a big stress on the employer, right? If their employee's not coming back to work within uh, in enough time and six months is a long time, right? For what to wait for one employee to come back. So we're gonna find out why, hopefully with these slides. Um, this is basically the uh, symptom scale the, uh, that's coming out of the uh, SCAT, right? The fifth edition. This is something I always grade uh, all my clients on the initial assessment. And then every, usually every two sessions. So we try and get an overall symptom score, how they're feeling. Uh, it's grayed out of, graded out of six. And uh, the key points here is trying to figure out, okay, what are the provoking triggers? Uh, is it noise? Is it uh, light? Is it when they're trying to work or uh, do something physical with their upper body? What's that initial symptom that starts triggering the cascade of other symptoms? Because most people with PCS that I see, they're going to have a good 10 of these, right? Like let's say six to 10 symptoms. Um, so what are the risk factors? So I always tell my patients that they're like the most famous painting that exists. For me, it's uh, Van Gogh's. And basically your, your recovery from a concussion is a reflection of your overall health, physical and mental before going into the injury. So every brush stroke that was taken to create this painting Everything that's happened to you, physical or mental, right? It's just an accumulation of where you are now. And based on that, how are you responding to concussion, to, to getting a concussion? Um, so we're just going to go over a bit of like uh, demographics. If you're a female, you seem to take longer uh, than males, right, to recover. Or there's more females that get concussions, but they also think that's because uh, females are more likely to report injuries versus males. Obviously, uh, you know, once if you're older, it takes longer to recover. Um, previous concussions is a big one, especially how, how long it took you to recover for your previous concussions. So I see that take effect as well. Uh, if you have anxiety disorders, you're going to take longer to recover. Any mood or seizures, that you also take longer. If you have a history of migraines or a lot of headaches, chronic headaches, you will take longer to recover. Uh, motion sickness, vestibular, if you've had vertigo in the past, that also affects you and how you recover from this injury. Obviously, initial impact is important when you get concussed. If you got hit, you know, let's say twice within the same hour, more like on the athletic side. Uh, but it's really your previous, how, how you were before, it's really dictating what you can cope with going forward into the recovery. Uh, so here are the main drivers for PCS. Okay, so there's autonomic nervous system dysregulation, mental health or default mode interference. There's neuroinflammation, visual or vestibular dysfunction, or neck dysfunction. If you have symptoms for longer than two weeks, you have one, some, or all of these five things. And this is why we have to try and figure out the order 
to treat uh, all these things together or one of these. Um, and this is the same as like, um, you know, for the psychologists out there, Maslow's uh, uh, pyramid, it's the same thing. We're going to create a pyramid for the concussion rehab to know exactly what do we need to start with, because you can't talk about your goals or your creative ability unless your physiological needs are met, right? Um, so we have to create a foundation uh, for rehab and how to live so that we can progress more quickly with the uh, recovery. Uh, so here's the patient's journey and stages of the recovery uh, pyramid. So a lot of my patients, they've, uh, let's forget about the acute uh, ones there, but the, the PCS ones, they've, they always tell me they've tried everything. So it's been like, let's say two years, they've tried osteo, chiro, massage, uh, Botox, they've done cortisone shots in the neck, uh, they've done hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So they're almost like stuck in a maze where they're going to try one door at a time, go down the hall, and they get a little bit better, or they plateau, or they regress, and then they have to come back out, try another door. And, you know, two to five years later, we have thousands of dollars spent out of pocket most of the time, because all my clients I see are, are private patients. And some of them have, haven't even gone through the basics of what you should be doing uh, in terms of the concussion protocol. Uh, so this is what we're going to kind of talk about. And uh, this is kind of like what should be done in this order when we're looking at a patient. So the pyramid goes pretty much, we want to interact with the nervous system. We want to calm it down. We want to improve sleep. We want to improve blood flow and circulation. We want to reduce inflammation and improve their nutrition habits. And then we want to rehab afterwards. So everyone that I, that I see has usually done the rehab part. They've done, they've seen the vestibular therapist, the physios, uh, the ophthalmologists, they've checked, you know, they've done all those fancy exercises and it's just not working or they're, they're at a plateau. And sometimes a lot of these practitioners haven't even looked at the other uh, bases of this pyramid. Some people I see haven't even uh, been given an exercise or an aerobic program, right, to increase circulation. So we're going to see after why that's so important. So that's pretty much the pyramid I've created. And some of this is taken from uh, some courses there that I can mention later but this is pretty much the hierarchy of how you want to treat someone with PCS. So step number one, right? Calming down the nervous system. Most PCS patients are in sympathetic overdrive, right? So we have our fight and flight, right? Sympathetic, and we have our rest, digestion, healing. We can only heal in parasympathetic. So most people I see, besides the PCS, the ones that are highly stressed with work and so forth, they're always in sympathetic overdrive. Uh, sometimes you'll see symptoms like extremely sensitive to light and sound. Those should be kind of like your, your triggers to see that, okay, yeah, they're probably in sympathetic overdrive because when we're in sympathetic, right, our, di our pupils are dilated, uh, digestion is more inhibited, so their ability to absorb nutrients is diminished, uh, a lot of adrenaline's pumping through. So we want to try and get them back into parasympathetic, right, to calm the nervous system down. The other thing that... Uh, gets kind of jumbled up with the, with the uh, autonomic nervous system is uh, default mode interference. So we have three networks. We have the default mode network, the task positive network, and the salience network, okay? Your ego, your self-talk, every time you want to, you know, you talk to yourself, that's your default mode network. Uh, task positive network, that's when you're doing something very specific, you're focused, so you're doing a math test, you're, you're working on a paper, and whatnot. And the salience network allows you to switch between these two modes. You can never have one mode active. Uh, sorry, you can't have both these modes active at the same time. So regular population, they can easily switch between these two modes. Uh, when we do fMRI studies on the PCS patients, we see that both modes are active at the same time. And studies are also uh, showing that People with generalized anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders, both modes are always active. So it's almost like, you're, you know, they're trying to read something, but they're always thinking of something else. They can't follow the lines anymore. And then the symptoms are just provoked. So that's an example. So we have to figure out a way to shut off one mode and try to keep only one on at the same time, right? So they can easily switch back and forth again. And the only way to really do that is to reduce anxiety, bring them back into parasympathetic. So 
I'm going to go through kind of three techniques. You know, they're just a few, just an example, a few, a few examples. Um, so the biggest thing is a lot of these patients, right? They feel like they have no control over anything, over their environment. There's a lot of stressors everywhere. One thing they do have control over though is their breath. So we always go over breathing. Usually it's uh, the first session if we have time, but I wanna give them the best tool and the easiest one so that they can commit to it. Because all those like uh, meditative uh, breath work, things like that, uh, mindfulness, it's very good, but most people I see are not into that stuff and they're not ready to start. You know, they, they don't even wanna do like a gratitude journal uh, at the end of the day, they're, they're just not ready. So one thing I can kind of give them and they seem to be compliant to this is uh, some breathing techniques. So the first one is uh, basically it was created by Jack Feldman at UCLA. So it's, it's heavily researched. Uh, it was popularized by uh, Andrew Huberman. If you follow his podcast there, the uh, Huberman show, and it's basically the physiological sigh, which is the uh, technique is it's a double inhale. The second inhale, you try to sneak a little more air. So the first inhale is very, it's pretty long. And then it's followed by an extended exhale. Okay. So it literally sounds like this. So if they try and do five to eight cycles of this, sometimes it only takes three. It's enough to bring them back into parasympathetic very quickly because it's a primal, um, it's a primitive, uh, almost like a reflex that physiological sigh, almost like when a, a kid after they're crying, you always see them gasp for air and they do this type of sigh. So it brings you back into parasympathetic. And I just tell my patient, try and do this every time your symptoms are provoked or you're feeling very stressed or you're, you know, a lot of anxiety, just try and do this a few cycles and repeat it throughout the day. So that one seems to be pretty easy to do. And it's very quick, right? It's, I'm not telling them to breathe for five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, I know some patients, they commit to 20, 25 minutes of like breathing, uh, which is very good. But most people I see aren't ready for that. Uh, the second breathing technique is just diaphragmatic breathing, right? So you want to increase your exhale ratio two to one. Um, so let's say you inhale for four seconds, you want to try and exhale for eight, right? And that will bring you into parasympathetic as well. If you're not ready to exhale for longer than an inhale, then you can just do simple box breathing, right? A four, 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 four pattern. And you try, you know, you start with 30 seconds, then a minute and see if you can build up to like five minutes. You can do that a few times in the day. That's, I've seen pretty good results with that with my patients. Uh, Another thing too is um, what you can do is to add the uh, proprioception to the rib because a lot of people can't expand 360 degrees with their rib cage. They only kind of uh, do chest or barrel breathing. So you can tie an elastic around your ribs and you try and breathe into the elastic, try to expand it equally. So I find that's helped too, to give kind of like a feedback uh, to try and increase the, uh, the inhale and the lung capacity. Uh, Tool number two, so we want to stim the vagus nerve. So cranial nerve 10, we know it's, you know, decreases heart rate, helps with digestion, brings you back into parasympathetic. There's, I can probably name you the 10, 12 ways to try and stimulate this. Here are just a few that we can go over. One of them is uh, exposure to cold. So you can do this a few different ways. One is um, you can take a cold shower. You can wash your face with very cold water. You can use a cold cloth uh, across your face as well. That will work. Some people will go in shorts and a t-shirt in cold weather and just walk outside for a few minutes. So exposure to cold seems to stimulate the vagus nerve. Any type of singing, humming, uh, gargling, gag reflex. So usually uh, I tell them to do this uh, after they brush their teeth. Uh, it seems to be simple and it's done right away. And the gag reflex can be initiated by uh, using your toothbrush and just brushing the back of the, the tongue. There's some studies showing that uh, taking probiotics or eating, uh, let's say, fermented foods, that seems to be helping because we're getting positive changes in our GABA receptors. That brings you back into uh, a de-stressed state. So there's a few studies looking at that as well, which is interesting. Sleeping on your right side has had the highest vagal modulation versus sleeping on your back, which is the worst. And then there's also uh, my colleagues in Toronto are working with um, micro point stimulation. Uh, and it's basically sending a microcurrent to the vagus nerve 
uh, at the earlobe, and then you put a uh, electric uh, one of the pads at the stomach, and just sending a small microcurrent to affect the vagus nerve, and that seems to be helping as well. And they're actually using that for uh, COVID uh, patients now. Tool number three is a bit more anecdotal. It's more personal experience, but there are some studies, but they're not the strongest study. But anyways, the biggest thing is trying uh, is seeing if uh, changing the colored lens would help them. So usually a red lens will bring you into sympathetic. If I try to put on a red lens on my patient, usually their symptoms will get worse. Um, Patients with a lot of uh, chronic, uh, let's say, headaches, or they have the migraine, green seems to relieve. And then blue seems to bring you into parasympathetic. So I usually try and see, uh, based off the assessment, right, what's been triggered, what's dysfunctional, put on the glasses, see if there's a change. And usually you'll see it actually a small improvement. If I see that there's a, a slight improvement, Okay, take the glasses home, use them when the symptoms are provoked, use them a few times in a day, just for a few minutes and see how you feel, you know, and they can switch between the two, the green and the blue, and they can kind of let me know what, what they feel. Some people won't feel much, others, it seems to be helping. So, but I'm still waiting for more and more studies on color therapy to see uh, where this is going. Uh, so now we're heading to our second base, so our sleep quality and habits, okay? We're currently th going through an endemic of terrible sleep habits due to the North American lifestyle. Um, so one, we can only get rid of inflammation. We can only, the resolution of inflammation only happens when we sleep, right? So the glymphatic, the glymphatic system was only discovered 2013. It's actually, it's pretty new, right? At first we thought the metabolic waste wasn't cleared out of the brain, but now we see that it is, that we need to ensure that we can get into a deep sleep, right? To try and clear this waste, get rid of inflammation quicker. Uh, so usually the first session with a patient, I have to actually go through sleep coaching with them because the schedule is completely out of whack. And I see this with, you know, my kids with, uh, my patients with learning disorders, or just regular adults. Um, and that could be, you know, going to bed at the same time every, uh, every night or trying to get up at the same time, which is more important, Monday to Sunday. Most people just do Monday to Friday. Um, another thing could be like taking a hot bath right before bed, and then the body's going to try and cool down, and that will put you into a deeper sleep. Uh, there's different teas you can use, uh, lavender oil. You can do meditation or the box breathing. Uh, set your room temperature at 18 to 90 degrees Celsius. So there's all these little things that, you know, different uh, ambient sounds you can listen to. Uh, and most of all is getting rid of screens, ideally the last like 30 minutes, 40 minutes before bed. Ideally it should be when the sun sets, right? You just want like kind of red light. Obviously it's not possible anymore. Um, but ideally I want that last 30 to 45 minutes, no more screens. And a lot of these people are, they, they're using the TV as their meditation, all right? They just want to veg in front because it makes them feel good, but it's completely ruining their sleep and their circadian rhythm. Uh, another thing you can do is try to get like five minutes of sunlight in the morning, five uh, at lunch, and then five uh, during sunset. Something to regulate your circadian clock. Uh, so super important. And sleep coaching is uh, it's one, it's one of your most important bases. So I find not everyone touches on this subject with their patients. Uh, improving blood flow. So this one, like I always see patients tell me, or they'll always tell me, yeah, no one's given me like a treadmill program. I don't know what exercises to do. And research has shown that the faster you start your exercise program, your aerobic work, as soon as you got hit or you got your concussion, the better off you are, the faster you will recover. Okay. Because there's a cerebral blood flow inhibition we see that there's, there's decreased circulation to the brain post-concussion. We want to increase circulation. We can only do that, do that through aerobic work, though. So a lot of my patients will try and say, yeah, I've been doing a high-intensity training. I'm doing weight training. Symptoms are getting provoked. I almost have to reset the clock a bit and say, okay, no, we're only going to do aerobic for now. I want to make sure that you know, we, we work out at a heart rate that's doable, that won't provoke symptoms either. So the way this is done is uh, it's just a treadmill test on an incline. You increase the incline every minute and you just measure their blood pressure, their heart rate, 
you check the uh, work scale for the uh, exercise intensity, and then it's just a, uh, a VAS score to see from zero to 10, okay, how are they feeling? As soon as you reach certain parameters, you have to stop the test, and then you have to work out at 80% of that threshold, right? So let's say at uh, 100 beats per minute, the symptoms are provoked above three points, you stop the test, you tell them, okay, every day, 20 to 40 minutes, you can start, we'll start with 20 minutes, you work out at 80 beats per minute, no matter what you need to circulate and uh, the brain. Um, with professional athletes, they'll do this the next day, provided the symptoms aren't bad. Usually with like above 16 year old athletes, I'll do this day three after a concussion right away. Uh, under 15, sometimes I'll wait like the five, six days, it depends. But uh, you need to exercise. You need to exercise at the right heart rate. So super important. The high intensity training, all that, that's the cherry on top. That'll happen at the end, 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 end. end. Um, I'm not going to touch a, too much on this because it's not in my scope of practice to tell people what to kind of eat, take as supplements. I'm not allowed. But um, when I listen to like my colleagues in Toronto, a lot of them are naturopathic doctors as well. We have to get it, getting rid of the inflammation, eating the right foods is super important. So one is uh, water intake. A lot of even my non-concussed patients do not drink enough water in the day. It's around uh, 25, um, per 25 kilograms of body weight, you should be drinking a liter. So most of us are above two liters in the day. It's very rare that I see someone that drinks more than a liter. Uh, so staying hydrated is super important. Also getting in the right electrolytes. So a lot of people shy away from uh, salt, right? We need our potassium, we need our uh, sodium, we need our magnesium, right? So super important to stay, get the electrolyte levels balanced as well. Uh, protein intake, a lot of people do not eat enough protein. Uh, so you want that one to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Uh, food choices are super important, right? You wanna decrease omega-6 fats, you wanna increase the omega-3. So a lot of uh, eating a lot of fish, uh, you can do walnuts as well. Flaxseed oils are fine too. Um, trying to get away from uh, processed sugars as well seems to help too. And with the detox process, uh, if it's been like more than a year, sometimes it's good to, you know, ask your GP, Hey, can I get like a blood panel done? Are there any nutritional deficiencies? Um, super important. I've seen a lot of, um, vegan patients with like B12 deficiencies uh, and since they're not eating enough protein, they're actually taking longer to recover as well. Although there's no studies done on that yet. This is what I'm seeing uh, at the clinic. Anybody with like a uh, food this type of disorder uh, for food, for eating, eating this, sorry, eating type disorder are having issues recovering. Supplements, usually the typical three that I see being prescribed um, or that are read about for concussions is, the, uh, is vitamin D3 with K2. Uh, magnesium threonate, so it can cross the blood-brain barrier, um, and the omega-3 uh, fish oil, right? To take those three are usually people seem to uh, get better with that. Um, so now we're going to head into the rehab part, the cherry on top of the pyramid. So everybody likes to do the vision exercises, the vestibular stuff, uh, but that has to be done only after everything we just spoke about is done. So the, uh, the tree, um, Sorry, the trinity here is the ears, the neck, the vision, and the eyes. Everything needs to be working together. You can't just focus on one without looking at the others, okay? So super important that the practitioner looks at all three or that the patient is seeing the specialist, but for all those three things. Uh, phase two is just more uh, rebuilding uh, memory, cognitive uh, executive functioning. So that's, even, that's all like the uh, cognitive uh, computer tests that are very popular. That's even that's the even the chair the second cherry on top. A lot of people go straight to that, which is not good. Um, so we'll start. We'll just talk about neck rehab just a bit there. But uh, testing the neck strength, right? Muscle testing is important. Figuring out why the neck is overcompensating for other muscles. A lot of people will have like weak uh, lats, right? Uh, and sometimes the neck could be overworking for the arms. So every time they try to do something with their arms, they feel their neck work. Um, so which is not good, right? So we have to train the body. We have to kind of reteach it how to use uh, the limbs and how to stabilize properly so that the neck isn't always used for everything. 
um, work economics are important. A lot of these PCS clients are working part-time. So going over, okay, how should your posture be when seated, right? Making sure uh, the knees, the elbows are 90 degrees. Uh, we're always focused on the lumbar spine, right? We need that support. But then people try and stay very tall in their chair. It doesn't last too long. Ideally, you don't want your, your ribs to flare up when you're seated. You want to brace a bit, bring the ribs down. You should be slightly sl uh, slouched and then in a relaxed uh, position. Um, sometimes a bit of like nerve flossing for the uh, accessory nerve that seems to be helping as well versus just stretching uh, the trap and holding it or massaging or dry needling it. Uh, so one thing you can try right now if you want is uh, you bring your, uh, let's say your left shoulder down and back. You can side bend your head to the right. You're gonna nod uh, forward or slouch forward with your neck and then you just nod yes up and down. You should maybe, some of us might feel that stretch across the uh, accessory nerve or the trap so doing gentle stretches like that seems to be more helpful. If people have jaw pain, we need to look at that. We have to make sure uh, that's also, um, sorry, I meant the, for the, uh, let's say the posture for the tongue position. A lot of people are clenching their teeth, whether it's at night or during the work when they're stressed. So we want to make sure that they're not doing that anymore, giving them certain cues during the day. Uh, so one of those cues could be, you want your tongue to be in a vertical position touching the upper palate behind the two top front teeth. So super important that it stays like that and the jaw is that is relaxed. So if you're not eating or talking, that's where your tongue should be at all times. Uh, a lot of people with like thoracic mobility issues, rib cage movement issues, uh, that will affect the neck, right? If one vertebrae is moving more uh, than the others, well, then there's gonna be more strain in that area. So if there's, thora if there's limited thoracic rotation, it's very possible the neck will try and move more, uh, which we don't want. Uh, a lot of people see osteopaths, so they get their cranial uh, sacral therapy done. I, you know, from what my patients tell me, that seems to help relieve some pressure too with the neck. So next we have uh, vestibular rehabilitation. So we just got to rule out um, any vertigo. Most people don't have that vertigo. Uh, and then you just want to train all the uh, reflex, vestibular reflexes, right? So you have your ocular, your uh, colic, and the spinal. We want to make sure that they're able to use their head at high speeds without provoking symptoms. So we'll kind of go through a progression system. Uh, let's say they're doing like a VOR stimulation where you're looking at your finger and you're just, you know, rotating your head in different directions. Well, now we want to get a speed and we want to increase that speed. So the goal is usually 10 reps within 10 seconds between 120 and 180 beats per minute. So they'll have a, uh, I'll usually tell them to download a metronome app and I'll just set it up at uh, like 180 beats per minute. This is the max I would ask for someone to move their, their head at. You hear the clicking and, and you just follow the beat. Okay. Obviously, if symptoms are provoked, well, then you just reduce the speed and then you habituate them. As, and then every week or maybe every few days, they can increase the speed by five beats per minute. Uh, proprioception and balance always needs to be worked on. It's always assessed beforehand. Um, so that's the vestibular part. Uh, and then we have the uh, visual system. So this is one of my favorite ones to work with. Um, so... During, um, during a concussion, peripheral vision will likely be reduced. And uh, in our bimodal function of vision, right, we have our focal vision when we're concentrating on writing or something ahead. And then there's the ambient vision around us. Usually with concussion patients, the ambient vision is, is actually a threat to them. It increases sympathetic tone. So we have to habituate them to use the ambient vision again, okay? So one way to do that is uh, binasal occlusion, where you take a piece of tape or you block the, um, the inside of the glasses. So they use less of their focal vision and more the peripheral and the ambient part. And they just put on those, they use those glasses, they hope they'll habituate eventually. And that seems to help for the uh, bimodal part. And then obviously there's like different vision sheets you can give them where, you know, like the, the top right picture here, they, they stare at the X or the smiley face they keep the piece of paper close to their face and they try and read the letters around. So that's one way to work peripheral vision. Smooth pursuits, saccades. So 
The saccades is similar to the vestibular where you're gonna increase the speed, usually between 120, 180 beats per minute is the max I would go. And uh, you wanna be able to, you wanna make sure that you're able to do the 10 reps within 10 seconds and move the eyes as quickly as possible. And you wanna train them to that speed. And that comes with habituation as well. Uh, with the smooth pursuits though, a lot of practitioners will just train general, you know, ranges of motion. So they'll do, okay, draw the alphabet draw a big circle, do counterclockwise, clockwise. What I try and do is assess which quadrant, which eye quadrant is actually causing the, or provoking symptoms and just training that quadrant. And that seems to do, that seems to help more than just giving them the general, okay, do like an infinity circle or just do a circle. Um, so that's what I've noticed. And that's what I kind of use. Always, I always test the eye quadrants. Uh, binocular vision, so that's just people that have double vision, and uh, they can either use a Brock string, so you'll see a picture of that later, or they can use pinhole glasses, which will actually increase slightly visual acuity and try to make the image, the double image as one. So I've seen the pinhole glasses work pretty well for anyone with binocular uh, dysfunction. And then obviously we have convergence. Can you look at, um, sorry, convergence and divergence, right? So being able to move the eyes together inwards and then back outwards equally. A lot of kids that have the learning, dis learning disorders have actually convergence insufficiency. So that actually um, provokes symptoms. Every time they try to use their eyes or doing uh, vision rehab, it seems to be provoking symptoms more, right? So we have to try and get them back. We almost have to rehab what the uh, dysfunctions were before the concussion, which is trying to get their convergence back uh yeah I'm just looking at the time i make sure i don't go over uh so phase two of rehabilitation so we want to improve conditioning so this is where you know the more high intensity anaerobic exercises come in uh and i find like this is what people want to try and do before right they're used to their uh, orange theory classes they want to do the high intensity stuff i tell them just aerobic for now now in phase two now you can try this again obviously controlled and we see what their capabilities are um we want to integrate visual vestibular challenges into an activity so you can do walking you can do biking and do the saccades or the um let's say the vors right rotating your head you can be trying so you're trying to do like adding in uh, multitasks uh, as the challenge uh, the cognitive loads is more like uh, so there's like a multi-matrix game that's the picture on the top left where they're sequencing a pattern uh, so it's working on memory, spatial awareness at the same time. So usually like uh, I either have them, uh, I usually lend them the game for like a few weeks. They can try a few rounds of that. But uh, anything cognitive is, is always good to work on, right? You're working on logic, memory, reaction time, decision making. Um, one thing I do use is the uh, neuro tracker. So this one's, uh, this was invented by uh, Dr. Faubert from UDM. And you're basically working on uh, multitasking, uh, attention, executive functioning, uh, all at the same time, you're following balls on the screen, right? And uh, so this is really the last part of the rehab. And usually with my athletes, I'll do this also as their return to play steps before they can go back to a game. Uh, so I can show a quick video of what that looks like. Uh, so it'll just look like this. So you're trying to track the four orange balls as they move. Obviously, this is a higher speed, so this is not what they're going to be doing in session when rehabbing, but uh, that's pretty much it. And you, you can do it seated, you can do it standing, they could be doing a multitask, let's say it's a hockey player, they're going to be stick handling at the same time, but uh, that's what the neuro tracker is, and that's one of the tools I use as the end phase rehab when we see that there's you know still cognitive deficits going on with the uh, patient. Uh, where am I here? Go back here. Uh, good. And then let's see what else was there in here. Yeah, there was the Brock string, right? So uh, visual suppression, trying to improve convergence. So that seems to help as well. Uh, and then another cognitive game I use sometimes is like a saccadic movement, but with the brain load. So you're just uh, naming the letters back and forth. That's the bottom right picture. So you're going uh, Q, then N, and then switching back to D, then M. Uh, sometimes you can ask them different, like you can add cognitive load to that, even like giving them math equations to do at the same time uh, or talking. It, it just depends. 
but uh, everyone's a bit different with this. And this, this is where like the practitioner can get really creative and kind of come up with a cool plan uh, for the patient. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you.